All right, guys, I'm excited for this one. This is one everybody needs to listen to. We're going to talk about stretching today. This is a whole thing we're doing all week is for players over 50. And this is super important. And it's something that even myself, I need to do a lot more of. And uh, we have with us today, George Wachtel. He's author of Senior Tennis. And he walks the walk and talks the talk. And because of that, he's still playing great tennis into his 70s. And he can walk and live to tell about it, right? <laughs> That's right. I can walk a semi-straight line. <laughs> and even today, you tell, we were just talking off, off uh, camera there. You had a big win today. I, I want everybody to know about it. I won't mention any names, but we had played doubles, our usual Monday group. We had a sub who's one of the top players in the country in the 70s who has multiple gold balls, and we gave him a weak enough partner that we beat him in doubles. <laughs> well, hey, whatever it takes to win. But I think what's so important about what you said, though, and, and I remember last time we talked, I, I know I, I had a guy come in this weekend, he's 60 years old, and he's like, well, I hope uh, we just have a few, I have a few more good years left. And as we even went into our warm up and exercises, we were doing jumping jacks and, and he got winded kind of kind of early in my mind. And, yeah. and I remember playing against you at the ranch a couple of years ago and I was thinking, and, and then the whole week where people are dropping like flies, and you can make it through that week relatively pain-free, can't you? Well, I probably said to you back then, which is my mantra now, that I plan to be, hope to be, top 10 in the nation in the 90s age group. And, I, and that will not necessarily be by skill. That'll be by default, that I'm the, one of the last men standing. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, that, that's such a great goal. And, and what you're saying right now, it reminds me, we, we got to interview the great Nick Bollettieri last week. And... And he was saying, age is just a number. It's what's in your mind and how you feel that counts. And I think a lot of people, as they get older, they get more into accepting phase and expectations of decline. But if you say, no, that's not going to be me, and then you actually take, rather than just the power of positive thinking, but you actually take action steps to keep yourself fit and to keep yourself feeling good, you can surprise a lot of people out there. You can surprise yourself and you can surprise your competition. Would you say that's fair to say? Yeah, well, I, I honestly believe that while I may not be as quick as I used to be, I truly believe I'm a better tennis player now than I have ever been. So that makes life very interesting because now when I used to start playing the tournaments, I was the low man on the totem pole. Now I'm kind of in the middle, middle of the totem pole. That's, that's fantastic. And would you mind telling everybody how old you are? Next, next year, I'll be playing in the 75s. That's, that's so great. And, and the cool thing is, is there's so many people, uh, certainly on your list, I would imagine, and my list, they're over 50, they're in their 60s, 70s. And talked to a lady, lady just the other day, she's 71, 4-0 player, and she says she's always looking to improve. And I think that, that that's really who I want this event to be for, for people who are always striving and believing that they can get better because – there is always something to work on. There is always that next shot that when you feel it, you're like, yes, that's the one I've been trying to feel for so long. That's it. Correct. Correct. I, I, there are several guys I know, and, and they're really in a minority who are always looking to do something better than they did before. Then there's the, the other guys who say, oh, I used to be able to make that shot, and they kind of give up on it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. So tell us about why stretching is going to be such a key to being able to, to, to still make that shot and to still feel like you're improving? Well, I, I have always been what they call a tight muscle guy. When I was a young guy, I used to lift weights and I was very tight muscle and forever pulling or straining something. And I'd say about um, a dozen years ago, probably 2005, a friend of mine got me into stretching. We got, we got a physical therapist come in and gave us a tennis specific routine for stretching. And I started stretching back about 12 years ago and I'm dramatically looser now than I've ever been before. And I have relatively free of injuries. I mean, I, we all get injuries, but I don't pull as many muscles, don't strain as many things. And the benefits of stretching is that if you're looser, you can actually bend deeper on the, on the shots that are low. You can rotate your body better than shots you need to turn on. You can actually lift your neck up when you have to hit an overhead. Uh, and, and also improves your range of motion of your joints. It also improves the circulation of your muscles so that you get faster healing because your muscles are really in better shape than they were before. And 
it's a stress release. It, it's a very relaxing activity to participate in. Yeah, I, I love that. E even today, and I think out of maybe guilt, lots. I, I always kind of like to work out hard. You know, I like to work out hard and run hard and this and that. And I, and I would, I would definitely classify myself as like extra tight. And so today I did a workout where I was like doing some some cardio, doing some strength, but then in between sets I was I was stretching and I felt so relaxed afterwards. I felt ready to take on the day. And I think you mentioned something that I want to really point out. You said you started 12 years ago. Now normally when people get into their you know, you were you were early 60s, I'm going to yeah, gather when yeah. you started that. And most people would say that they if they're not flexible by 60, how are they going to get more flexible? Right. And, and, and when I started, uh, when anybody starts a stretching program, we'll talk about this at the end as well, you got to be careful and you got to be very patient and you have, to, you have to ease your way into it so you don't actually pull muscles while you're stretching. But uh, uh, Peter, an analogy I will use with you about the relaxing part is that in the 70s and 80s, I was an avid runner. I should run four or five miles every day. And when I first got started, my brother gave me a book. He said, read this book. It'll change your life. And the book was something called The Long Run Solution. And it was, the concept was that when you went out jogging, you shouldn't run as fast as you could, and you shouldn't run hard. You should run long and slow. And that was really the mantra I took up when I was running. And it's really the same mantra that you take in all your activities. Do it longer and slower, and you'll do it much better. Hmm, very, very cool. And I think that what's so great about what you're saying, one of the big, we, we put a survey out and probably the number one answer of frustrations as you get older playing tennis over 50 is that people feel like they're losing a step and they're losing reaction time. So can stretching help combat that, do you feel? No, I think that's something. I think stretching will give you more flexibility when you do get to the ball, but there are other things you can do. And you and I will talk a little later on about reflex volleys and, and improving reflexes. But that, that's a separate activity, I think. I really think that it won't improve your reflexes because it's just the reverse of that. It's more of a slow motion activity. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think as far as but what you're saying, that last step, getting there, to be able to having the confidence to stretch out and get there Correct. Correct. can help at the end getting that yeah. step back. A shot where you're like, oh, I can't, if I reach for that, my back's going to go out, exactly. you know, which, which, which I actually step, know what that feels step. like like the short drop shot that you're running in for and you say, well, do I give up on it? He said, no, I can get there and I can bend. That's great. I mean, that's something I'm dealing with right now, to be honest. If, I, if I'm teaching for a while, you know, my body just starts to feel like the Tin Man, you know, and, 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 and things that I used to when I was younger, just I could be teaching, I could be a little stiff, and then I see a ball over there, I could just run for and get. Yeah. Now I know that I'm either on or I'm off. And, and so... I definitely need to be listening to this just as much as, as anybody else. So take us through uh, how we should stretch. I think that's where we're at right now. So the, the, the classic concept of stretching is what's called static stretching, where you take any pose, whatever the pose is, you take that pose and you hold it for five, six, seven, eight, 10, 15 seconds. That's static stretching. The, the new concept taught to, to by you and I both by Larry Starr, who's the trainer at our tennis camp at John Newcombs, who was also the trainer for the Cincinnati Reds baseball team, talks about dynamic stretching. And I'll, I'll go back a little bit and just show you an example. For example, dynamics, static stretching is with you would hold your hand back like this. If you're stretching your wrist and your forearm, and that would be static stretching. Dynamic stretching is doing one second, release one or two seconds and release one or two seconds and release. So the two kinds of stretching would be the dynamic stretching and the static stretching. And the, the, the research has shown that static stretching, the kind we traditionally do, if done before any kind of exercise, will actually tire the muscles out for that exercise. So they're recommending that you do dynamic stretching if you're doing it before an exercise. Okay, very cool. Cool. So dynamic, kind of get yourself going, then do something for a little bit and back and forth, kind of like that, kind of move. Well, if you remember, if you remember from camp, another phrase from Larry Starr is he, he says you want to get the big muscles ready to work. So he gives us, a, and before we go out in the morning at John Newcomb's, he gives us a series of really semi-exercises. They're not stretches, they're semi-exercises that get the big muscle alert and saying something's happening, be ready get loose, get blood flowing to those big muscles so that when you actually call upon them, 
they're not dry of blood and they don't cramp up or they don't strain themselves. So that's Absolutely. a different kind of act. That's, that's more getting loose by, by waving your arms. If you're watching the dial before a match, he's always jumping up and down. He's getting those big muscles ready for exercise. Yeah, that's great stuff. And yeah, certainly we do that at, at Newcomb's Ranch, which is great. And, and, and the cool thing is, is George and I are going to do some, some stuff, some videos there. We're recording this before we go to the ranch, and then we're going to be doing stuff at the ranch. And the biggest legend there, that, I mean, when you're there, it's, it's like being in a tennis field of dreams. It's, it's one of the best yeah. feelings you can have as somebody who loves tennis where you're just like, I, I'm like, I can't believe I'm like in this atmosphere right now. It's, it's really, you have to pinch yourself, but then everybody's so down to earth and the biggest legend and probably the most down to earth guy is Rod Laver. And, and he talks about how he would love to do what he called jack knives, which is basically jumping jacks to get loose. Yeah. That's one of the things that that's what Larry Starr does at the end of the routine, which is the probably the most tiring thing. And, and again, getting those big muscles going, all your back muscles, your thigh muscles, your stomach muscles, get them loose and get blood flowing to them. But, but I, I, for one, do my stretching before we do that activity, which goes back to the next thing I'd, I'd like to suggest you we talk about is that when should you stretch? Now, th there's two schools of thought. Uh, school of thought, which is the one I ha happen to fall into, plus I have not limited time, that's not a right, limited ambition, probably a better thing. If you're gonna stretch for me, if I stretch at all, I stretch before I play tennis. There are other people who believe that you should stretch after you play tennis. Uh, and, and I think that probably the answer is that if you have enough time and commitment, you do, do both before and after. If you're stretching beforehand, you would stretch using the dynamic stretching. If you're stretching afterwards when the muscles are looser, then you do the static stretching. So the ideal, and for, especially for guys who have bad backs, you, I think guys with bad backs would wanna stretch both before and after doing the exercise and for me, I also use that stretching time before tennis as kind of a mental preparation time, where if, if I'm playing a match against somebody I know, I, I do my stretching. And while I'm stretching, I visualize the match, visualize the court, and visualize what might be going on, try and visualize strokes and how I might want to play the match. So it's a good relaxing environment to get yourself both mentally and physically set to go out on the court. I, I think that's huge. I think that's a big advantage, too, over a lot of competition, because you know, many people out there, I'm sure they're in leagues and you're usually standing around, maybe you're eating a couple of pretzels. Uh, I've been known to eat a cookie yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, you're on. And then you go out there and, you, you know, when you think about you're at that state and then you're going to compete against somebody who more takes it like you or like a Rafa Nadal who's backstage doing shadow strokes and moving their feet and and little things like that um and you know since this is legends week i remember roy emerson when i when i did play i'm not playing this year he would always say go out there flat to the boards mate and and he meant basically like you go out there and you go hard as soon as you start hitting balls and and you jump on your opponent early and and john newcomb you know i remember when i interviewed they weren't together at all but john newcomb said Roy Emerson would kill himself to break you early in a match. And, and to be able to do that, you've got to have your, your mind and your body both ready. So I think what you're saying is so good. Yeah, it's critical. I had a friend of mine who on a relatively cool day, didn't do any kind of stretching, went on the court, ran for a short ball and pulled both quads, his left quad and his right quad. And he was out for weeks after that. And it's, it's really, it can be if people talk about investing the time, well, how would you like to be out of tennis for four to six weeks instead? That's really the, diff the difference. Yeah, I think that 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 is absolutely huge. I mean, um, you know, that is actually what well, I, I know. I've kind of been very self-effacing this whole time, kind of making fun of myself, and I'm not the most flexible guy. But one thing I do do, and I think it was a habit from juniors, is if I'm going to play a match, I'm definitely – thinking about the match. I am doing jumping jacks. I am stretching. I try and do a combination of, of stretches and, and movements and swings. So when I hit the court, I do feel like my whole body is loose and, and ready to go. And, and, and also, I feel like I've started playing the match before I hit my first ball. And I, I think that makes a difference. Yeah, I agree. And, and let me add to something you said about uh, stretching before playing a match. I believe in trying to stretch every single day whether you're doing anything or not. Uh, I, I'm, my routine is that I try to stretch every day, seven days a week for 15 to 20 minutes. 
Uh, there was a story that was somebody was telling a story about uh, Djokovic. They saw him waiting for his his car to take him to to and from a match, and while he was waiting, he was outside stretching. It had nothing to do. He was it was a practice day. He was off that day, but he was doing stretching, waiting for the car to come. So and you can sit there at night. You can stretch your pull a, your your leg into your chest. You can stretch. You can do the stretch with your, your hand across, pulling it towards you. Lots of things you can do just to keep on maintaining that discipline of doing that, and even even an investment of 15 or 20 minutes a day is really very minor in the day. Most of us are in the in the post work era, if not full time, at least part time. And there should be enough time during the day to keep your body in shape. Uh, absolutely, that's that's so great. And so they're sitting there. What what are, what are some of the ways that you like to to stretch? What 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 are the times of day? You know, how do you get it in? Do you do it sporadically throughout the day? How how is it? Do you have a routine? Yeah, well, my my body clock is that I love to play tennis in the morning. I mean, if, I have a couple of friends of mine who are still working, so I'm, I'm forced to play tennis with them at four o'clock in the afternoon. And my body clock says, hey, this is not when you play tennis. So normally I play tennis 9, 30, 10, 10, 30, 11 in the morning, something like that. And my routine is to stretch before I play tennis. So I'll stretch typically at nine or 9.30 in the morning. And that's a, a great time for me to do that. It's not necessarily right before the match, but it's a fact that I'm stretching the muscles so that when I go to the match, then I'm relatively loose. Now, on the other hand, if I'm playing a tournament somewhere, let's say I live in Naples, Florida, in hurricane ravaged Naples, Florida. Yeah. Uh, let's say there's a tournament in Sarasota, which there are down here in January and February, and I've got to drive two hours to the tournament. Well, I'm trying to give myself enough time to get to the tournament like an hour before the match is supposed to start so I can get out of the car, work out the kinks from the road rust that are there and do my stretching at the venue rather than do it in the, in the house and then drive two hours and try and walk on the court from a long drive after that. So it depends on where the match is, is being played and, and how it's being played to when the stretching comes. But I, I would try for every day. And for me, I'm a morning stretcher. Uh, I know a couple of friends of mine, they stretch before they go to bed and they say it helps them sleep. So I think that's another activity you could think about working into your schedule, whether you're a, a morning person or an evening person. Mm -hmm. And doing all this, because I know also you're very competitive. You play a lot of matches. You talk about going to tournaments. I certainly know that when you play a match, you know, you can, you can maybe go out there and practice for a couple hours and, you know, you might, you might feel like, Oh, that was a tough practice today. But when you play a match because of the, the stress, even if you don't feel nervous, it, it's just a different feeling when you're done. And, and a lot of people out there, I'm sure that maybe they, they get to play maybe one or two practices during the week if they're lucky. And then they go out there on Saturday or Sunday for their team. And then they got to play that match and they're, they're under that stress for their whole team looking in. And, and I, I know the feeling of being beat up after a match. And then the thought of having to go play another match the same day, well, gosh, forget that. So how do you feel after you play matches, especially if you're in a tournament? Are, are you, are you beat up and achy or do you feel pretty good the next day? Well, it really, really depends. I mean, sometimes you can go out there and you have a match again, and it's relatively lopsided one way or the other. I mean, I could beat somebody 6-1, 6-1, or one of these top guys can beat me 6-1, 6-1. So that's over in an hour, and that's no big deal. But if you get a, a tournament match against somebody who you're relatively equal with and end up, end up playing three sets, I have a couple of three sets, three-hour matches in, in the age 70-plus, that's a challenge, especially down here in Florida where it's relatively warm. Uh, and, and I will be real achy. Now the challenge will be and that some of us, and I do um, usually play singles and doubles both in tournaments, that you play a singles match in the morning and then you've got your doubles partner waiting for you for a doubles match in the afternoon. And sometimes you don't have a full tank of gas to go for that. So, so sometimes now I've been thinking about doing more singles in some tournaments and doubles in other tournaments so that you're not disappointing your doubles partner when, when you get out there. But I'll give you another, another concept, Peter, about playing stressfully. Uh, Roy Emerson and I share the fact that we both had prostate cancer at the same time back in 2005. His was at the end of 2004, and excuse me, 2007. Uh, his, his was the end of 2006, and I was the start of 2007. And after coming through that, it gives one a totally different perspective on what's important in life. And going out for a tournament match nowadays, you know, I could be playing one of the top guys in the country, and I'm really not very nervous because it, it, lets, you, it lets you say to yourself, I'm only playing a tennis match. So if you can do your stretching beforehand, you can do an adequate warm up and you can keep your mind relaxed and let you know 
in the relative terms that this is not that important, you can really relax your mind and body both and play much better in my opinion. Uh, I think I think you're absolutely right. Um, now let's say you play a match, you're achy. How do you go about the recovery process? How do you what what are some things you do, whether it's taking an Advil or or what, what how do you how do you recover when you go, oh, I kind of did it to myself today? Well, I, I'm a, I'm a believer now. I'm, I'm not sure how many of the uh, viewers out there are regular takers of ibuprofen or Advil, one of those things. But I used to be uh, have breakfast of champions, just like everybody else, take a couple of pills before I went on the tennis court. And I felt OK. So about, I guess, eight years ago, maybe, I stopped taking pills. I don't, I don't, I will take something if I think I'm injured and even anti-inflammatory, I'll take something, but I do not take a pill before going in the court and don't take a pill going after the court. And, and I don't think that makes a world of difference. For me, the biggest benefit is I live down here in Florida and attached to my pool, I have a, a hot tub, a jacuzzi tub, and it has a very powerful jet. So after almost every match that I can, I get in there and I essentially do a water massage. You know, the pros, when they get done with matches, most of them get on the massage table and they get a full body massage. Well, I get a full body massage in the hot tub and that essentially I think really makes a dramatic difference on the recovery of the muscles after an event like that. Uh, I, I, if I had a, a masseuse living in the house with me, I would get a full body massage, but barring that the jacuzzi does a pretty good job. Also, there are rollers, and I'm sure you see the, the, the body rollers that they have where you can roll your muscles. That's another thing to, to get the lactic acid out of your muscles. Uh, but that can be relatively important to try and get yourself loose before you, you get going to the next activity. Mm. I, 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 once, I, I, I played a tournament up in Sarasota. I played a, again, it was a hot day, and I played a three set, three hour singles match. It was a constellation finals. I happened to win that. And on the, I said to my wife, I, think, I said, I think you have to drive on the way home. On the way home, I curled up in a little ball and I was cramping all the way home. Mm. So sometimes you can do things to an excess and you have to watch out for when you push yourself a little bit too hard. Yeah, absolutely. Um, all right. So you mentioned that you like to take the, the, the hot jacuzzi, which, which I like as well, too. Let, let, me, let me interject, Peter. It doesn't necessarily need to be hot. It's the water massage effect that I'm going for. It can be a cool jacuzzi. It can be even be a cold jacuzzi, but, but it's just that it's comfortable enough to get in, but it's the water massage part of it. Okay. Okay. Very good. That's what I was going to ask about. What do you think about the difference between hot and cold and when would you use one over the other, or is it just preference? Do they both do the same thing? What, what does one do versus the other? And when would you use one over the other? A, a doctor friend of mine has told me that when you get done playing or you have an immediate injury, it's ice. And as soon as that immediate time has gone away, then it's heat. So for me, that if I had an injury, I'd put ice on that injury, whether it be an elbow or shoulder or knee, put ice on the injury until it, it's calmed down. And in, in all honesty, I believe that all these things that we talk about, whether it's ice, whether it's heat, whether it's copper, whether it's massage, uh, they all have the same benefit. And that benefit is to bring, bring blood to the affected area. And that's what they're trying to do, bring blood to the area to get the healing process working faster. Very good. Now it says here, I have some of your notes. It says here, you're a mix of stretches, yoga, and Pilates. What's the difference between stretching, yoga, and Pilates, or what are the types of stretching? What, are, what would be some examples of that? Okay, my, my routine is kind of a hodgepodge. I had, as I said, uh, a dozen years ago, we had a, a physical trainer come in and give us a, a tennis specific routine of stretches. And then uh, my brother gave me a, a, a CD on yoga, and I saw some stretches in there which were very good different activities. They were yoga movements, and, and I, so I've incorporated those two things. A stretch is essentially taking one specific muscle group and doing an activity to bend it away from its, its normal activity. Uh, uh, for example, uh, if somebody were to lay on their back, take a, take a stretch band, put it around their ankle, and straight-legged and pull their leg back to them, they're stretching their hamstring muscle behind the, their leg. Uh, when I first started doing that, for example, I could get it almost to the vertical. Well, now that I've been doing this for a dozen years, I get it beyond the vertical. Hmm. And, and that allows me, that's a stretching activity. Whereas a, a yoga movement will probably move, will probably impact well, three, four, five, six different muscle groups if it's a good yoga movement. And it's an it's a activity that will allow you to do stretching in various directions 
Uh, and I recommend that people get a book on yoga, get a CD on yoga, and take a look and so things, so things you can do. The last one is Pilates. And this was, uh, it, I was introduced by my daughter-in-law who was big into Pilates, and that's really building up core strength, the stomach strength. Uh, again, a big believer of mine, there are some uh, controversy, arguments, disputes, however you want to debate it, on whether the, the impact of the stomach muscles on the back muscles. I'm a big believer that if your core is strong, that supports your back muscles. That people who have bad backs typically have weak cores, weak stomach muscles, and they don't do enough to, to support them. So Pilates are activities, it's a variation of what we used to the old sit-ups, the old crunches, but the crunches nowadays are not uh, popular, but these are more things to do to keep your core muscles in, in line and, and strong. So I do a combination of those three things, and I try to do those probably three times a week. So when I do stretching, seven times a week, I'll do the Pilates, yogas, and, and, uh, and, and the more core exercises uh, three times a week. Okay, and is that a longer workout or is it still 15 it, to 20 minutes? It just, just adds another five or 10 minutes to the activity. So again, for those of us who have enough time on our hands to do unimportant things, this is an important thing. Absolutely, so uh, before we get into how to get started with all this stuff, tell me some of the things that you see what have you noticed over the years from people who just kind of go, ah, that's not for me. I just want to go out there and hit balls. I, 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 a friend of mine who shall remain nameless is an avid stretcher when he's injured. And when the injury is over, his stretching is over. So what I see are people who are, are just only committed to when they have a problem that they're trying to solve. And, I'm, and I try to convince them that the problem they're trying to solve is that they should try and not get injured. So if they did more stretching, they, they would probably not get injured. And my stretching that I try and do, I try and do, for example, another friend of mine had a very popular ailment right now is plantar fasciitis. You know, how many people do you know who've had plantar fasciitis? Well, two of the stretches that I do are for the feet. And I believe that I have not had any symptom of that because I stretch, if I were doing my feet, I do my feet stretches this way and do the feet stretches this way. Both ways are part of the whole stretching routine. And, and by the way, there, there are, oh, I'm trying to get, there's the camera. In my book, there's a whole series of all the stretches that I do and they're described in there. And if anybody has the book and they want any more detail on it, feel free to give me an email and I'll try and give you some more detail on how that stretch is done and, and what the benefits of doing it. But I try and do stretching when I do it, essentially from the feet all the way up the body and up to and including the neck. A lot of people who don't do neck stretches and think about if you're in a car and you're in a stop sign, and you're turning left to see or right to see how your neck is typically stiff. So how far can you go? Can you actually see, if your neck is loose enough, you can literally see behind you. You, have a, you should be able to turn your head so that you can literally see right behind you. Can you see behind you? I can, I can see the board a little bit. Okay, and go the other way. Can you see the board with the other eye? Oh, I can't see the board that way. I can see a pot and my microwave. So, so if you did a little more neck stretching, I would suggest you'd be able to get around with both turns, see the same spot behind you. Wow. So, my so goal yeah. is to make my head spin around. How's that? <laughs> yeah. So again, back, back to the stretching. So the stretching should be everything from feet to calves to hamstrings to lower back to stomach to, to shoulders to wrists to neck. That's great. Kind of like building the kinetic chain, right? Up, up the Correct. body. Correct. Exactly right. That's very cool. And, and so... George's book, by the way, will be on this page. You can, you can see the link right next to the video or below or wherever we put it that you guys can click it to check it out. Um, where, do you, where do you sell that book? Amazon.com. Just Amazon.com and Senior Tennis and it'll pop up. Very cool. So how should people get started? They're intimidated. They're like, oh, man, stretching ain't for me and I don't have the time. And I just feel bad about myself when I stretch because this feels awful. Like, how do they get started? When are they going to start to see some results? How does it all work to where you're like, yeah, I'm going to do this forever now? When, when I was in my working career, I first worked for an insurance company for 12 years before I started my own company. Uh, and there was a book that I read, which was how to get control of your time and your life. And in that book, the, the guy talked about setting priorities, priority A, priority B, priority C. And what he talked about was... Uh, people get, get phased by having insurmountable A's. It's an A priority. They know what they should be doing, but it's such a big deal they can't do it. So my suggestion, like, like anything else in, in life, start just do a little bit each day. 
Pick any one stretch you want to do and do that one stretch. The next day, add another stretch. The day after that, add another stretch. Just do a little bit of stretching and you find yourself getting what I call a positive addiction. For me, stretching and tennis both are positive addictions. If I don't have them, I don't feel right. And, and then the next thing you want to do is you want to decide whether you want to try and stretch before you play tennis or after you play tennis, or you want to try and do both. But, but as I said before, you have to have patience. For me, when I started stretching, again, I remind you, I was a very tight muscle guy. It took me three or four months before I was comfortable doing the stretches. A full three or four months before I said, my muscles are not going to break by my doing this. And that's another point, probably the last point I'll make to you is that when you're doing stretches, especially early on, push it up until the point of pain, but not beyond that point. So whatever stretch you're doing, once you feel that pain, ease off. And push the, the stretch again, and you feel that pain, ease off. But don't push it past that point of pain. That, that, that is great stuff. Very good. And uh, I, I know we should all be doing everything that you're saying and you're the example of why to do that you're, you're out there you're feeling good you know I, I can't tell you how many people write and talk about rotator cuff injuries or they bought a course and like can i be on hold because i just you know tore this or this blew out and uh yeah. and and one thing i think that we all have in common whether we're i think a lot of us are not passionate about stretching but all of us are passionate about tennis and to have that taken away from any of us would be very depressing. You know, I've, I've had people say when they quit tennis and things like that, they literally suffered from depression. So, you know, uh, it's so important to do everything we can in our control to, you know, have such a positive addiction in our life, which is tennis. And, and by picking up another positive addiction, uh, that's that's a good thing. So thank you so much for your time today, and we'll see you at Nukes. See you shortly. <laughs> All right, that's George Wachtel, everybody. His book is Senior Fitness. You can grab it Senior by tennis. clicking the link here. Senior huh? Tennis. Senior Tennis. Oh, Senior what I say? Tennis. Senior Fitness. Senior Tennis, guys. Senior Tennis, and the book is right there. So so click it and pick up a copy uh, and. It, you're going to learn from somebody who's who's doing what you love. He's out there playing tennis, and he's feeling good. He's competing hard, and and uh, he's living to always tell about the next day, which which is not easy all the time. So thanks so much for your time today. See you shortly.